Good morning. Good morning, onlineers and on the phoneers. Uh, welcome along to Ammonford Evangelical Church's Sunday morning service. Um, it's really good to have you with us. Maybe you haven't been here before. Maybe this is the first time you're tuning in. Uh, well, real special warm welcome to you. My name's John. I'm one of the pastors of the church. I'm going to be leading us through the morning. Um, and if you've been here a thousand times, well, then a real warm welcome to you as well. I hope that you're doing okay. Um, can I just say, we really miss you. If you haven't been back to kind of Sunday morning church service for a while, um, we really do miss being together all together in one place. So if there's anything that you're struggling with, with kind of anything that's keeping you from coming back that we could help with, if we could make it safer in any, any way or reassure you or just help you um, somehow to get back together, meeting kind of in physical fellowship with other people, then we'd really love to do that. It's a precious thing for God's people to get together and worship him together. So if there's something we can do to help make that happen for you, then we would love to do that. Um, but let's get cracking. It's Psalm 100 that we're going to start with today. Psalm 100, if you've got a paper Bible and you split it almost exactly in half, you'll find the Psalms flick up number 100. I wanted to read us a few words from that Psalm. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. That's really what we're praying for today, isn't it? That God would be with us, that we'd enter his courts, enter his presence with thanksgiving. But my pastor at university used to start Sunday services by saying, we've come from the presence of the Lord, and he's with us all the time, with the presence of the Lord, so he's in us, he's in those who follow him, to the presence of the Lord. We've come from the presence of the Lord, with the presence of the Lord, to the presence of the Lord. And that's true of us this morning. Jesus says, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there with you. So that's our prayer this morning, that we would know God as our God, that he'd be close to us, that it would be Jesus who is speaking to us today. It's Jesus who's helping us pray today. Jesus who's stirring up our hearts to sing and to worship him in everything that we do. So let's pray and ask that that would be real for us, that it would be our experience this morning, that Jesus is with us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are our God and that we're the sheep of your pasture. We're the people who belong to you. Father, we thank you that, that you promised to be with us. And so we come into your courts with thanksgiving this morning. Lord, there's been so much happen in our lives this week, so many good things that we have enjoyed, so many of your blessings that often we haven't even noticed how good they've been. And so, Lord, we want to give you thanks for our lives today. Father, there's also been lots of stuff in our lives this week that has been um, difficult to take, um, that's been full of sorrow and grief. And so we pray that you would help us, that you would lead us through those dark valleys. This morning, you would put your hand in ours, Lord, you would scoop us up and help us to know your presence, comforting us through the difficult times we're walking through. Lord, there have also been things that we are ashamed of this week, um, things that make us feel guilty because we've done what's wrong or we've not done what we know we should have done. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us of those things. We thank you that, Lord Jesus, you went to the cross to die for us, to bring us back to yourself, to bring us to your Father, to give us your Holy Spirit, to make us part of your people. Lord, to give us freedom from our sins. So we pray that you would forgive us again this morning for things that we've done, Lord, for things that we haven't done. Our Lord, we ask that you would help us to bring those burdens to your cross and leave them there, that we'd know the freedom of being your children, your people, of coming into your courts with thanksgiving and praise. So Lord Jesus, we pray that you'd be present with us this morning, that you'd help us to sing and to pray and to listen, that you'd be speaking to us and teaching us. And then going with us, Lord, as we finish up this video, as we... As we go about the rest of our lives, as you've called us to this week, we pray that you would be present with us, not only as we worship, Lord, not only as we gather, but we pray, especially as we go and live for you moment by moment, we pray that you would be with us and guide us, teach us, and Lord, shape our lives to be more and more like you each day. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you Pharisees because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it. One of the experts of the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, To you experts in the law, woe to you, because you lord the people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. You testify that you approved of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you built their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom has said, and I will send the prophets and apostles, some of whom you will kill, and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who are entering. When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the inner ear, in the inner rooms, will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. But I will show you who you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before the synagogue rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say.
Every season, inevitably, there's this photograph that does the rounds online. It's a photograph of a football fan with their head in their hands, dressed head to toe in replica gear, usually wearing the scarf with the colours of their beloved club around their neck. And the photo is of this fan, head in hands, tears streaming down their face. And the tears are normally brought on because of one of two things. Number, number one is that they're near the top of the table, but a defeat against a lesser side has really, really nailed the colours to the wall. Um, the die is cast, the title is not coming home. Or, at the other end of the table, the number of games is running out and relegation has been confirmed. And so, for that person, when something they love something they care about is suffering, is struggling or in a vulnerable position, it moves them to tears. And, that, and that's true for you and I, isn't it? When someone we love, someone we care about is suffering or in that dangerous, vulnerable position, we can be moved to tears. And you know, it's tears that we're supposed to hear 
Jesus speaking these woes in Luke chapter 11. It's through tears that we're supposed to hear Jesus saying, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you teachers of the law. It's not the first time in the Gospel of Luke actually that Jesus has used that language or that emotion. It's there in chapter 6, mingled in with the Beatitudes. Jesus says on the one hand, blessed are you, you, you lucky things, it's wonderful for you. And then on the other he says, woe to you. Woe to you who are rich, to, to you who are well fed, woe to you who laugh. Then again in chapter 10, he's speaking to, uh, to towns who have witnessed who he is, what he can do, who have heard his teaching, seen his signs, and he says this, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Often I think when we hear these words from Jesus, woe to, we imagine that he's saying them simply coldly, callously perhaps, that what he's doing is passing down judgment and, and listing a list of charges against these people. That we'll hear Jesus saying it, and basically all he's saying is, you are guilty of this. And there's an element of that involved. Or, maybe more generously, we'll hear it as Jesus sort of offering a, um, a caution. Caution, watch out, you're in danger of these things. And that's going on as well. But like the football fan bemoaning the tactics of his favourite team or the supporter prophesying further trouble ahead, um, what is overwhelmingly felt there is sorrow. What we're supposed to associate with these wars in Jesus' being is weeping. David Gooding, who was a commentator that John and myself have been leaning on heavily in our time in Luke, puts it like this. The woe is a mixture of indignation and sorrow, frustration, um, displeasure, and sadness. But the sorrow is far more than the indignation. Which makes the obvious question this then. What is it about these people, about the Pharisees, about the teachers of the law, that Jesus is so sorrowful for? Should we join in with him with his weeping? Should we heed the warning that he is giving them in the midst of it? Questions for us to consider this morning. And I think broadly speaking, the sorrow that he feels can be summed up in one of two ways. He's sorrowful for the situation they find themselves in, that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law find themselves in. He looks at them, he looks at their lives, he looks at the things that they order and prioritize and chase after, and he is sad for them. But more than that, he is sorrowful for the impact that they have on people around them. That He's sorrowful for the environment that they create. You see, as much as we love to paint the Pharisees as the pantomime villains, and let's be fair, there's plenty in their actions that don't really help their cause, for the most part, Jesus here is addressing people who are earnest. They're sincere folk, or at least that's where their journey began. You know, if we really scratched beneath the surface to understand what motivates them, uh, what drives them, when we need to know a little bit about Israel's history, the things that have gone in in their past, and where they find themselves in that moment. I hope you know enough about Israel's history that you know that they were the special people chosen by God, rescued out of e uh, um, exile in Egypt, the Exodus. They're thrust into this new land. They have God, they have the space, they have the law, they are a chosen, a precious people. But their lives aren't lives of living that out. Their lives and their history is of seesawing, of, of yo-yoing, back and forthing between um, devotion to God and contempt towards Yahweh. Uh, Flip-flopping back and forth between purity for his name's sake, love and obedience of him, and complete and utter disregard. And what happens to the people 
is that more often than not, when God is kicked out, judgment comes. And it puts them in very difficult, unenviable places. Enemies attack. And that all culminates after a, t- a great time of prophets in the exile. When Assyria and Babylon come and just wreck the joint. They tear down the temple. They deport the people. Israel really isn't a thing anymore. They've rejected God. And God has punished them through the exile in that way. And what happened in that period of history is that an awful lot of the people began to really take seriously and take note of the privileged position that they had, of being a people who had been rescued by God, being given a law of how they should conduct themselves towards God and towards one another, of how they should, through love and obedience for God, be lifted up as a beacon to the rest of humanity. They, they began to take that seriously and really became very weary of the other side of that, of their history of rebelling against God, of ignoring God, of, of falling into uncleanness and impurity and idolatry and, and really strove to be the people who would keep hold of God's blessing. Now, fast forward to Jesus' day where the Pharisees find themselves and they're once again under the foot of an oppressive uh, superpower. This time it's Rome. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are people who earnestly believe that if they purify themselves enough, if they keep themselves right enough with God, that their righteousness, if you like, will rub off on other people, but will counterbalance and outweigh the impurity of the rest of the nation. And God will come in and God will rescue them. God will lift them back up again. And so what they do is they become a people who really, really want to serve the nation and serve God. But, but this is where it all falls down. Because in the midst of their zeal for God, for the, for the nation, for following his laws which is commendable. You see, the the reason Jesus weeps for them is because they'd lost the woods for the trees. They'd misunderstood the things that God had called them to as ends and objectives themselves rather than an outworking and an overflow of what God was truly calling them to. And we can see this most wonderfully summed up by Jesus in verse 42. Chapter 11, verse 42, and Jesus um, says this, doesn't he? Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, your rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You neglect justice and the love of God. The rules, the minutia had overtaken in their, in their lives, in their hearts, what they truly were supposed to be all about. To the teachers of the law, he says something very similar. He says about them being a people who were supposed to help others come in to know, but they themselves have not entered. They've missed the mark. And you know, there is that danger for you and I this morning, today, this week as believers, that we can miss the Jesus-shaped woods for the gnat-sized trees that we can become so obsessed with orthodox doctrine, that orthodoxy, that saying, believing, doing the right things is the main thing, that we forget that that orthodoxy is all in service of one, in service of Jesus. You know, they, the Pharisees, they loved the prophets who were calling the people back to devotion to God, And yet they'd missed out the essential message, which was this, not to purify oneself ritualistically so much, but to pursue God with everything, to love one another with everything, to do ultimately what Jesus came and said time and time again, to love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says that is the summation of the whole law. That is the key um, and the rule of his entire kingdom. That's what it looks like to enter into eternal life. And you know, for you and I, there is this danger 
where the things, the truths, the scriptures, the doctrines that we have, the, the practices, the cultural markers that we have that are there to undergird and to support that, they become more important to us than the truth about Jesus and the, the, the call that Jesus puts on our lives to love God and to love others as ourselves. Brothers and sisters, we have to be very careful that we don't fall into an obsession with the details and forget, in that sense, Jesus. Because that's sad enough if it's true of us, Jesus is weeping over them and their state. They're zealous people, they're earnest people, they're religious people, they're people who are taking his word and his law seriously, but ignoring him. We can be like that, but more than that, Jesus weeps because of the impact that they have. I mean, it's actually, if you eyes to see it, a really chilling description of the Pharisees and of the teachers of the law. He says this, that you are like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it now again you might not understand that the context old testament of cleanliness of not supposed to be going near dead bodies that these people who thought through their purity they could purify those around them jesus says actually you're doing the exact opposite when you focus when you fuss on the minutiae to the neglect of the major, then you are actually leading people astray. Or to the teachers of the law a little bit further down, he says, you think, you think that you are honoring the prophets. You think you're of that tradition of saying, yeah, we stand with you against these lawbreakers, against these rebels, against these people who have brought judgment on the nation of Israel. But do you know what? You actually stand in the history, you stand in the place of those who killed the prophets who ignored what they had to say, who weren't interested with the minutia or the major. That's really where you sit most comfortably. And he says, woe to you with sadness, woe to you because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You've become a stumbling block. You yourselves have not entered in and you have hindered those who are entering. Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps not just for the situation they find themselves in, but for the environment that they create. It's an environment of death. They're leading people further from him, not closer to. And you know that there is that very danger for you and I, brothers and sisters. That when we drill down, when we take for something to be the main thing, which Jesus never said it was, when we lift it and we elevate it above him, and what he claimed to be the main thing, to love God and to love our neighbours, to know him, to be known by him. We are leading people astray. We are leading people into it. We are creating an environment of death, which is so far from the life that Jesus lived, isn't it? That everywhere Jesus went, he brought life and healing and blessing and purity. Jesus weeps because of where they are, so far from him, even though they think they're searching in the right direction, but he weeps because of the impact that they're having around as well. And so the lesson for us is this, to make sure that we don't fall into majoring over the minutia, that we don't miss the Jesus-shaped woods for the gnat-sized tree. Now we can do that in so many ways. We can make a particular doctrine so, so important that the defining mark on whether you're a Christian or not is what you think about creation, uh, what you think about, I, I don't know, modes of baptism. I don't think that's a particular danger for us. What you think about X, Y, or Z. We can elevate things. Or in wanting to serve a picture and a worldview where Jesus is in control, Jesus is, is ruler, Jesus reigns over all, we can become obsessed with outworkings of that. Like in our current day, should you or should you not have a vaccine? Do you know that there are people on both sides of that debate who have completely and utterly lost side, sight of Jesus? That the minutia, the outworking, the thing that's supposed to serve and support the truth that Jesus 
is king over all, that Jesus is a Lord and that we are to come to him for life and light, that's been totally lost. Because either it's being served by a narrative of vaccines undermining that, or vaccines being the only way to serve and to submit and to love. And we obsess about something like that, whether we wear masks, and divorce and marriage, whatever it is, we have our opinions, and that becomes the litmus test. Jesus, you're sitting down for food, you have to wash your hands. If you don't, well, in our modern culture, we would say he's un unhygienic, but in this culture, you are not a representative of the one true God. And Jesus turns around and he looks at them and he weeps and he says, how could you have gone so far in the wrong direction? You may be right about tithing mint and rue. You may be right about avoiding bodies and graves. But you have completely missed, completely missed the call of God, the call of the prophets, the call of Christ, which is to love God and to love one another. So Jesus is weeping and, and we should weep too. We should weep too for those who have been near us and have drifted. We should weep too when we, we feel ourselves drifting in that same way. We should weep too when we see others influenced by that sort of environment of death. And we should be humble enough. We should be willing enough to admit when we've slid in the wrong direction when we've stuck our head in the rabbit warren, as it were, and gotten it stuck. Once we've started to become to those around us, not a light on a hill, but a, a stench of death to them. We can't fall into the trap. We shouldn't fall into the trap of majoring on the minutia, missing out on Jesus for the gnat sized doctrine or life application. And we should be willing to repent when we recognize that's the place that we're in. But Jesus doesn't stop there, or Luke doesn't describe Jesus as stopping there, as weeping over these people. He, he's got another move to make. He goes not only from um, um, weeping, warning, um, showing where they've gone wrong, how they've lost, lost their way. He, he turns to his disciples. And he offers an encouragement that I'm not entirely sure many of us will see as an encouragement to begin with this morning. Speaks about um, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law beginning to oppose Jesus fiercely, to besiege him with questions, to really pursue that putting him to death, fulfilling what he's saying that they're about, people who hate the prophets, people who hate people ultimately who tell the truth. They're, they're, they're living that out. The pressure is increasing. The, chapter 12, verse 1, speaks about this great crowd gathering round. I think it's the only time there's mention of like a danger in this crowd. The trampling one another becomes a very real possibility. It's a serious situation. It's a tense, it's a scary situation. And Jesus turns to his followers. Jesus turns to those who have come to know him and trust him. And he says, be on your guard against hypocrisy. Be on your guard, dear little sheep. Be on your guard against saying one thing and doing another. I think the context would have us understand Jesus as saying this, a time of pressure, a time of testing, a time of persecution is coming where you'll want to stay devoted to me, but you will fear men so much that your lips will confess something else. I think that's what Jesus is saying, the context of the pressure, of the testing, of the opposition Jesus is facing. And Jesus says to them, do not be hypocrites. Do not love God in your heart, but in your speech reject him. Because that's the temptation when times get tough. For those of us who love God, for those of us who want to pursue justice and to, to love other people, for those of us who want his kingdom to come here now on earth, not if, but when we face opposition towards that, the temptation will be to cower back, to shirk back, to hide, and not necessarily to become like the teachers of the law who are an obstacle, 
but to put a light, a basket over the light that we've been given. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't do that because ultimately, number one, it's a waste of time. Because everything that has been hidden will ultimately be revealed. If you truly are a believer, that will come out. And no matter how much you keep shtum, you'll get found out and you'll get hunted down. And then you're just, it's even worse. You're a hypocrite as well. But he goes a little step further and he says, do you know what? You shouldn't be a hypocrite. You shouldn't be scared of men because their power and their authority, they only reach so far. When that persecution, when that testing, when that pressure comes, and it will come, Jesus says, their authority, their power, their rule will only go so far. Don't fear men who can kill the body. Fear him who beyond death has authority to throw you into hell. He says, yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear the Father. Fear God. Fear the one who is in charge of it all, not human beings who are limited, who are finite, whose power and authority will run out. Fear him whose authority has no end. But Jesus isn't trying to scare them straight. Jesus isn't trying to scare them straight. Notice what he says exactly next. He says, that one dear sheep, who has that power, who has that authority that goes above and beyond your actual life, he knows you. He cares for you. He watches out for you. Aren't you worth more than a sparrow? Doesn't he know the number of hairs on your head? So this is how he concludes, verse seven, don't be afraid. You don't need to be hypocrites. You don't need to like hide Jesus in your heart and, and, and be fearful of confessing him with your mouth and following him and pursuing him and, and the love of him and the love of justice obsessively in a world that hates those things. He says, you don't need to fear it because your father, the one who is really in control, knows all about you and you are worth so much more to him than many sparrows. And he goes on, but it's even better than that. The reason that you don't need to fear men isn't just because the Father knows you and is on your side, but because the Son knows you and is on your side. Whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, okay, this is the context that helps us to see that the hypocrisy is loving Jesus but denying him with our lips, then the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. That you will be recognised not just here on earth but in the spiritual realms as well. And the Son of Man who commands those legions of angels in service of caring for us and blessing us. It's mixed in with a warning. You know, reject the Son and he will reject you. But if you know the Son, if you confess the Son, he will confess you. The Father and the Son are on your side. What is that? Compared to these people, to these rulers, to these authorities who want to do away with you the eternal father and the eternal son. And then he speaks about the Holy Spirit. And again, perhaps we read this passage with fearful eyes. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but one who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will be never forgiven. And we think, oh my dear, oh my days, there is something that I can do, something that I can say that can put me beyond forgiveness. That though the Father knows me and cares for me, that though the Son may once have acknowledged me before angels, I have now made a misstep and I am beyond redemption. Keep reading. When the pressure, the persecution, the heaviness comes, when synagogues and rulers and authorities drag you out in public, those who confess the Son, those who hang on to, the testimony of the Holy Spirit. After all, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth we read in John 15. He leads us into the truth about Jesus' divinity and his humanity and the effectiveness of his life and his death and his resurrection. When we hold fast to what the Spirit has said, don't worry in those pressures, don't worry in those testings or those persecutions, for then that Holy Spirit will teach you 
Well, you should say the same one who has opened our eyes to the truth will be the one who leads us into difficult circumstances and will lead us through. Can you see the encouragement that we're supposed to take here? That the Father, who has all authority and power, not just over life but beyond life, that the Son, who commands those legions of angels, whose voice and word ultimately is the one that all creation hangs on, that the Spirit, the, the Spirit who speaks and leads into truth, if, whom we reject and we are cast outside, who, who wants to give us life and if we say no, we receive only death, who wants to bring us to light, if we say no, is only darkness, who wants to bring us into relationship and if we say no, we're only on our own, away, cut out, lost. That same Holy Spirit wants to be with us and, and will be with us and working in us and through us. So Jesus is saying, you guys don't need to be afraid. You have it all in abundance. Stand firm. So, dear brothers and sisters, this is what we learned this morning. This is what we need to take away this morning. Is that it is a sad thing. If something beneath Jesus is lifted up above Jesus in our lives. If something which apparently is supposed to serve loving God and loving others becomes a God in itself. Becomes something that we love more than one another. And... The guarantee that Jesus' persecution did come. Perse persecution has come. Uh, pressures and opposition are the very air that we breathe, that the church has always breathed. And Jesus says into the midst of that, stand firm, do not be afraid, for he who is for you is greater than he who is against you. You have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit on your side. Why would you ever let those things go? Jesus' call to us then, or, or Luke's call to us, in Jesus' words is this. Stand firm. No matter what comes at you, no matter what temptation, no matter what pressure, no matter what my, my minutia might capture your vision and your gaze, stand firm in Jesus. Stand firm in his law to love God and to love one another. And all the rest will be added to us. Amen.
O God, our Saviour, help us. We are slow to learn. We are prone to forget. We are weak to follow. We are not as far along the path as we ought to be. Too often our hearts are graceless, our days prayerless, our hours wasted and our opportunities unspent. Make it our greatest joy to draw nearer to you, to sit and listen and receive before rising to obey and live for you. Grow in us your grace so that our character might reflect you all the more. Our efforts might be put to your ends and our affections might be rightly directed towards you. Help us to never mistake your creation for the glory and goodness of its creator. Help us to have faith, a faith that seeks you each day, a faith that shares you each day. Renew us, our God. Fit us for your service. Fix us for your kingdom. Amen. Well, that's just about it from us this morning. So thank you to you for tuning in, uh, for logging on. I hope it's been a, a good, kind of nourishing um, spiritual food for you this morning. If this is your first time, like I said at the beginning, well, uh, welcome to you. If you want to make more of a personal contact, maybe get involved with um, church a little bit more than online, then um, we have a church website. You can contact us through that, ammonfordchurch.com. You'll find a contact form there. Um, write us a little message that'll drop into my inbox or Sammy's inbox, and we'll get back to you soon. It'd be great to get to know you a little bit more. But thank you. Thank you to you for tuning in. And thanks to Sammy as well, who always puts these videos together. Well, as we began, let's finish. We go now from the presence of the Lord, with the presence of the Lord, to the presence of the Lord. And we go with his blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace this week, next week, and every day until we meet him face to face. Amen.